Okay. Hello everyone. Um, so sorry for the technical um, glitches that we had at the very last minute there. Thank you very much for hanging around um, for a few minutes while we, we got that sorted. Of course, everything was working beautifully 15 minutes before we started, but you know, that's the nature of technology these days. Um, so good evening. And welcome to our online event this evening, which is Degrowth in Central Victoria, hosted by Goldfields Libraries. My name is Jess, uh, and I'm the manager here at Castlemaine Library. Working beautifully 15 minutes before we started. I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting tonight on the lands of the Jaja Wurrung. Um, so, good evening, and welcome to our... And that they are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and the waterways that I am coming to you from. Goldfields Libraries recognises the living culture of our First Nations people and their ongoing and deep connection to country. I would like to pay my respect to Elders past and present and to any Aboriginal people who are joining us this evening. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to our guests this evening who will be having a conversation about degrowth, which is living with um, a minimal um, ecological footprint locally and also as a society. And they'll be talking about what this might look like in central Victoria and also what it might look like in your own lives, wherever you're joining us from tonight. So it's my pleasure to- Anitra Nelson is the co-author of the recently published book, Exploring Degrowth, A Critical Guide. It's got a beautiful green cover. I must say, this is the cover, this is the color my kitchen is painted. I love this color. <laughs> Um, Anitra is an activist scholar who focuses on living environmentally in environmentally sustainable ways. She is affiliated with the Melbourne Sustainable Society Institute at the University of Melbourne. Patrick Jones has contributed to key, a, a key chapter in Food for Growth, for, sorry, Food for Degrowth, Perspectives and Practices, and Anitra co-edited co that, it's due out in December. Patrick is a degrowth practitioner. He is a permaculture teacher and a storyteller, and he lives and works with his family in community-oriented ways in a quarter acre garden ecology on the, um, the margins of Dalesford and the Wombat State Forest. Uh, just before I hand it over to Anitra and Patrick, I'd just like to um, encourage everyone to, uh, as questions arise throughout their conversation, which I'm sure that they will, please pop them in the chat and we will have time at the end of the conversation to pose these, these questions to Anitra and Patrick and have a bit further chat about that. So without further ado, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Anitra and Patrick. Thanks a lot, Jess. <laughs> now the first question we address in our Exploring Degrowth book is what is degrowth? In a growth economy, quantity and monetary values such as prices and gross national product dominate. Growth economies breed inequalities and they're environmentally unsustainable. And degrowth is the opposite of growth because degrowth focuses on quality instead, on social values and on environmental values. Whereas our mainstream economy operates on a dynamic of endless growth, degrowth advocates an economy that respects the earth's limits while satisfying everyone's needs. In other words, degrowth is as much about decreasing inequities between people and giving everyone the security that they'll have enough to eat, have safe and comfortable housing and suitable clothes to wear and so on. Degrowth is not about economic depressions, recessions, austerity, or poverty. Those are experiences that are characteristic of capitalist economies of growth. Degrowth is about meeting everyone's needs in cooperative ways. It's about sharing and caring. I invited Patrick Jones from Dalesford to participate in this presentation because he and his family have de developed degrowth practices in their everyday lives. But before he explains to you how they've gone about doing that, 
I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about the book Exploring Degrowth, which came out in August. The lead author is Vincent Ligi, who I first met at a degrowth conference in Montreal around 10 years ago. Vincent is a well-known spokesperson for the degrowth movement in Europe, where activism for degrowth first originated. We explain the origins and arguments for degrowth in the first couple of chapters, but we mainly focus on the politics, challenges and practices of the degrowth movement. It's a book about activism and visions of degrowth. It's a short and we hope easy read. It includes a couple of cartoons by Michael Lunig, as well as a photo of Patrick holding up a degrowth placard at a climate change rally in Melbourne last year. The big question after asking what is degrowth is always how do you achieve degrowth? In short, our approach is to develop strong local economies where people work locally to satisfy their own basic needs. We talk about collective sufficiency, which means using cooperatives and models such as community supported agriculture to work together. Producing our needs locally means minimizing the costly material and energy expenses of transport for goods and people. The degrowth movement has developed the term and practice of open relocalization to refer to such local economies. Many people fear that approaches focusing on small self-sufficient communities are prone to become closed, self-interested and intolerant. In contrast, open relocalization advocates for creative and welcoming self-reliant communities, communities that are excited by diversity and open to incorporating ideas from anywhere. Degrowth communities and centres invite social diversity as well as treasuring biodiversity. My co-author Vincent, for instance, lives in Budapest with his Hungarian partner. They belong to a degrowth formation called Carganomia. Carganomia integrates a bike cooperative with an organic vegetable farm and a self-organising bike messenger and delivery service. Here, low carbon transport meets sustainable fair trade food. They make and repair bikes. They hire out and use their cargo bikes to distribute fresh fruit from their farm. One of the farmers came to Budapest as an adult from the United States. Vincent is French. In a multicultural way, using different languages, they train and offer work experiences for locals. They offer an open space in the middle of the city where people can engage in cultural activities. They help anyone who comes along with a degrowth initiative. They're expanding using degrowth principles of equality, meeting basic needs and ecologically sustainable practices. In this way, they work convivially. Conviviality is a term that Ivan Illich developed into an approach to social life and to work. It means taking a cooperative, mutual, sociable and sharing approach. Conviviality incorporates tools that are simple and appropriate for the job. These convivial tools need to serve the common interest. Illich often emphasized technologies or techniques that citizens could easily use and make decisions over their use. This means that the ways that we produce things can be easily organized into commons and through commoning. Commons are co-accessed, co-governed and co-created cultural and natural resources. And commoning is all about those activities that comprise the commons. I could go on talking about terms and practices that have been selected or developed by degrowth activists, but I think you've heard enough from me. So Patrick and I, um, we'll now converse until question and answer time. And my first question to Patrick is for you to explain how you and your partner, Meg Ullman, have developed degrowth practices in your household and your wider central Victorian community. Thanks, Anitra. Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to, to start by 
uh, acknowledging uh, Jarrah people's economy, um, probably the ecological economy of place that um, is uh, deeply old on this country. Um, and so while uh, we're, um, yeah, we're, we're particularly attuned to the fact that an ecological or su a true sustainable economy actually has taken place here in human contexts for most of human history. So that's, I guess, the place where Meg and I start. But I think also I want to acknowledge our boys here as well, um, Zeph, uh, who's grown up and left home, but also Woody, because, um, uh, and also our dog, Zero, we're, we're all um, degrowth practitioners. Um, and, and, you know, I'll, I'll get to Zero and, and what he eats later in the question time, because that's often something, um, you know, we know what you eat, but what does your dog eat? Um, we, we get that question a lot. But I, I think for us, it started from a longing to, um, a longing to belong, uh, a longing to um, depart from and not, uh, not hand over um, hard earned cash to um, big powerful forces uh, to reclaim um, uh, our economic reality, our economic frame, and um, choose the terms in which we engage economically as a household. Uh, and that really started um, for me a long time ago um, as an environmental activist, jumping in my ute to go out to a blockade in the Wombat Forest um, to stop the Kennett government from wood chipping. Um, uh, turning turning our beautiful forests into um, pretty much hamburger wrappers. Um, so, and then coming back on on the way way home in, in my car, stopping at Coles, getting my food, and then slowly realizing that th that while we were attempting to stop one big thing, where I was also contributing to all these other big things and recognizing that food and energy uh, and medicine uh, resources, industrial food, medicine and energy are really big uh, contributors to ill health, to, um, to people's well, uh, lack of well-being, to the environment's lack of well-being. And so that if, uh, we'll, so that, that kind of thinking led to reading and researching permaculture, and through permaculture, using those tools, the nuts and bolts that permaculture gave us to then start to enact a radical uh, form of economy, which we, we I guess we call neo-peasantry or subsistence neo-peasantry, but also degrowth. And um, I think, yeah, so, you know, we started, the first thing was to get access to land. So uh, Meg and I, I, I guess nearly 14 years ago, land was so much more affordable in Dalesford. It hadn't gone into the full boom. Um, for low-income people like ourselves, we could get some access to land. We knew that having land ownership was problematic politically. And that was a really, that's a big story and it continues to be a big story in our household. How do we decouple from privatized land ownership? However, we knew that food, energy, and medicine resources, actually we can do stuff about that immediately. We can, we can degrow our, our reliance on capital food, energy, and uh, medicine. And, I, and I, what, I, I guess decoupling yourself from industrial food or capitalized food and energy, you kind of automatically decouple yourself from industrial medicine because you need so much less. Uh, and in our household, um, uh, basically none. Um, so it, living well, being physical, physically engaged in um, procuring um, our energy resources and our food resources um, and building relationships around those things. So our neighborhood became the most important thing. Uh, we, we started with friends, community gardens. We um, we, Meg talks about our bin line a moment when we'd set up our, our chooks and our worm farm and our composting 
um, bays and all of a sudden we didn't have to use a bin liner. Um, this is, you know, what, probably 12 years ago. And it was such a fantastic moment in early on in our transition away from, I guess, what we call uh, pollution ideology, or that is sort of, you know, the ways in which we've been raised in this culture to really just uh, go along with uh, th that, those systems of waste that we've been born into. Um, so it, it does take some effort to go against the grain, but I guess, you know, many years later, having, you know, we haven't, um, the things that we gave up that really sped up our transition were, were things like cars, supermarkets, and tra uh, plane travel. And those three things enabled us not having, um, being much more in, uh, having greater autonomy in our economy meant that we didn't need to plan overseas trips or, you know, we didn't need to escape. Um, we, not, uh, not that we went overseas very often. I think Meg and I have been once together as a couple. Um, but uh, the, yeah, so um, really uh, reinventing, uh, recreating uh, the home economy and community economy into what we now call community sufficiency, um, which is very different to, I think, self-sufficiency or self-reliance um, because it really depends on relationships. So yeah, we got rid of our first car, parked the second car in the driveway, um, started getting around on bikes. We were very unfit at first. Um, you know, at, at this early stage, I was definitely going to the local GP two or three times a year and, um, you know, I was reasonably fit. I was a builder. Uh, but one of the things, getting rid of our first car, then our second car a year later, meant that I didn't have to, I could give up building work. I could stay at home and really develop this, uh, the garden. And gardening, I, I had some skills through my parents growing up. So gardening wasn't this new thing to me. I certainly had a lot to learn. And um, I'm still learning in that department. But yeah, just putting back, I guess, uh, all, the, all the nuts and bolts and relationships, um, neighbors, uh, uh, the, uh, the nearby forest and wild spaces for, um, for ferals and weed species of plants that we eat, uh, finding out all the things that, uh, that was now going to be our new supermarket. Once we got rid of our cars, got rid of supermarkets out of our lives, and these were you know, it took some time to set up. We um, started to orientate towards a very different way of living. And even though it requires work, it's um, the work is always rooted in meaning and meaning making and relationship building and relationship making. And so, so now that we live in a neighborhood of, you know, I don't know, 20, 15 to 20 households, uh, this is before we get out in further into the community, into the town in which we live, where we have lots of gift exchange and bartering going on between friends, but just in our neighborhood, we're um, engaged with our neighbors in a community managed forest where goats uh, are used to, to mitigate fire risk, but also to enhance biodiversity. Um, that's a big story, but uh, we've got quite a lot online about that. Um, yeah, uh, doing working bees together to repair the creekside ecology, um, neighbors uh, organizing with neighbors to pull out old tires out of the creek, um, making these biomes that we, where we get our food, where we forage these kind of feral foods to mitigate, um, I guess, uh, um, newcomer species to mitigate the, uh, the dominance of newcomer species. Let's eat the blackberries, we say, let's not poison them. Um, uh, so I guess what I'm trying to, to do is paint a, a picture of a number of different processes um, with people, with more than humans, with indigenous, um, always with, with uh, the Jara consciousness and Jara uh, as far as we know and as far as we've, um, uh, uh, we've been told and we've listened to the stories of Jara people. Um, contemporary Jara folk and the elders, um, and then also listen to our own ancestors pre-capitalism, pre-capitalism, uh, 
pre-Christianity um, because our old ancestors also hold relevant stories for living within limits and living in relationship with the living of the world. So what about paid work? You... Yeah, so I, I've been on this thing um, since I pretty much left home um, to resist as much paid work as possible. Not because I shy away from hard work, I love, love hard work. Um, but uh, yeah, really uh, all my adult life, I uh, have never believed in, um, in, in that as a way of being. Um, it's always, when I've had to do it, I've, I've, it's always been a soul crushing thing to me. Um, so I've always just made, um, before meeting Meg, I, I just making money from jam, just doing a whole lot of different things to get back to writing poetry, to get back to making art, to get back to, to doing political work or um, activism stuff. So, um, so when I met Meg, Meg was incredibly great or is an incredibly great frugalist, um, really. And, and I, I was just never that. Like I was just, I didn't have much money, but it always just flowed through me. So Meg, uh, you know, I, we, we, through Meg's influence, I got rid of a credit card. We only had debit cards. Um, we basically just um, completely uh, reorientated our economic way of being to live so um, unless uh, so um, frugally, but richly and time richly. So I guess the process over the last twelve years for us has been a transition from uh, to to time to time wealth and cash poverty. And now I guess we're around um, uh, 80, 85 percent off the monetary economy, and that's as a family. Um, so and Woody's growing up with the uh, Zef. Uh, our eldest boy grew up with some of this stuff, but we were still very much living the old story with him. And I think for him, it, it was a bit more confusing and difficult. Um, whereas Woody is sort of like 100% neo-peasant born and bred, and uh, he um, totally gets it. And, uh, you know, he's, he's part of that world every day. And so that's what we call in degrowth, frugal abundance. Yeah, I love that term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good, isn't it? It's so good, yeah. So we thought we'd talk about what degrowth means in terms of actually growing things. Yeah. We've already referred to a lot of that, but it really does mean growing real social and environmental values, sharing and caring grows, yeah. you know, caring by all genders and ages, for all genders and ages, sharing resources, skills, knowledge, and in particular, I think healing the earth, growing natural environments that have been previously damaged by occupation and by exploitation. So through regrowth, through regeneration, yeah. growing socio-cultural diversity, celebrating diversity and yeah. biodiversity, growing local production, growing self-reliance, arts, crafts, creativity, yeah. Exactly. And I, I think that's the important thing um, pe for people new to degrowth is, is that we're degrowing growthism, we're degrowing um, industrial capital or um, economies that just take and don't make returns, that have no rituals to give back um, for a, a continued abundance. And in so with degrowing necessitates a growing of of other relations and other economic and social relations. And one of the terms that we like to use, um, and I guess we're proud to coin is social warming. Um, just, just how, when you have time to be at home and time to engage with your neighbors and to take over half a dozen eggs um, and you know, joyfully get a jet, jar of jam, back in return, but not necessarily expecting anything. I think that's the other thing that we've come to, to really love is that the economy that we want to be most involved in, and we are now most involved in 12 years down the track, is a flow of gifts exchange. And while formal barter is important in the building of relations and in, in the building of trust, um, so that when we don't quite know someone or we're new to, we're both new to, to both parties are new to, 
an exchange, we'll make it more formal. We'll actually say, oh, well, um, if, you, uh, if you make this lovely T-shirt for me, I'll come down and chop your tree down <laughs> that's hanging over your house and it's um, going to come down in the next storm. Um, so, yeah, so that's more formal. But when, when trust is there, uh, and this is what we're really establishing in our neighbourhood and further afield in the, with community kin, is that it's just a flow of gifts. It's, and it's so clunky to actually have to register um, and to account for economy. But when, and this is where I think we're starting to get close to what JARA, um, traditional JARA culture and certainly uh, contemporary JARA culture is re-performing is um, this codependency that we're giving up debt, we're putting debt, we're attending to debt and our indebted, um, sorry, our, our debt to capital, but becoming uh, socially indebted. And so there's nuance in those stories and relationships. There's, there's an exchange is, um, it comes with a story. And so if we don't wanna have a story, <laughs> well then, you know, uh, the mon monetary economy is great because you, you go up to the markets with your five bucks and hand it over and get some carrots. But generally, if you're going up to the local markets, you, gen you like for us, we like to have a conversation with the grower. If we're not growing carrots at the moment and we'd like some and there's some in season here locally, uh, we'd like to you know, ask the farmer how they're going um, and, and engage that way. And so, you know, local, that's where we're, we're not strictly uh, anti-market as well. Uh, local, local markets of exchange, um, uh, I think really fit within our degrowth, um, uh, I guess, version of degrowth. And I think to, to, to get back to something you said about diversity, there, what I love about the degrowth movement, just like permaculture, it's not centrist. It's not, it is basically saying how we do it individually and in our households and communities is always different. We're just, there's just a set of principles. Permaculture has its principles and degrowth has its principles. And, you know, what, one of the things I've really enjoyed about reading this is really just discovering um, how much work um, in terms of the uh, more academic and scholarly, but even the activists as well coming together in across the world to converge to um, find through consensus uh, the principles of degrowth because of course it's it underscores a whole lot of different activity that's been going on for many years. And I think that you know we've talked a lot about economy but in actual fact um, degrowth is very rooted in a concept of um, local politics as well autonomy as you say consensus decision making what's sometimes termed horizontalism in terms of power sharing um, we're concerned about really listening to people around us and respecting how they think um, and taking time to talk through a transformation. So we're all moving along together and to learn all of those skills of self-organising um, and co-governing, which means that we really all need to be as much on the sort of same page as possible. Um, I also sort of thought um, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, some of the organisations or other activities. Um, I'm sort of thinking uh, in central Victoria that we have um, that contribute to localising economies and, and, and degrowth. You mentioned like farmers markets, mm -hmm. um, but I know that um, just this year, um, a group of us have got together called um, Central Victoria Mutual Aid, and we're looking at, at mapping as much as possible. And I remember you did some wonderful maps and actually we'll be drawing on um, maps that numerous people around Central Victoria have done in terms of identifying visually um, and in terms of location where there are sort of all these great activities happening um, in terms of local economies. Maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the extra activities like that that are happening in yeah. your area. Yeah, well, here, um, Meg and I are really passionate about um, the whole skill sharing 
um, a lot of workshops in in the permaculture space or um, I guess the homesteading space are very expensive and cost prohibit prohibitive. And uh, I suppose we've been quite determined to um, set up uh, a number of different workshops and uh, regular month prior to COVID, um, regular uh, monthly uh, get togethers or um, seasonal get togethers around. So we've got uh, a beekeepers, a natural beekeepers group that um, have uh, specific speakers come and, and speak. And, and, you know, people who are just starting off with natural beekeeping can actually um, find out all they need to find out and have a community of support around them to do it. Uh, so all of us are keeping bees at various stages, right up to, you know, incredible experts like Ange Enbom and Enbom's Honey is, I guess, best practice at a uh, in terms of small um, commercial apiary. Um, so uh, Meg um, established um, a culture club, which is fermenters for all um, ex uh, uh, abilities. Um, so, uh, and yeah, that, that's been going for the last several years and holding monthly free work, monthly workshops on fermenting everything. Um, so, you know, lacto-fermented pickles. We know what fermented food is in terms of preventative medicine. It's it's amazing uh, food for the gut. It, therefore, it's good for our health. Therefore, it's good for our human neural compost systems, and therefore, it's good for our soils. So, um, yeah, uh, there's other things uh, I've been facilitating for ten years. The um, uh, the community gardens here. Um, there are uh, friends of ours have started uh, a seed library, which uh, has borrowed um, the idea from Castlemaine, um, which is was housed in our library until COVID, but is now housed in um, the uh, wonderful Hepburn uh, Whole Foods Collective, uh, and that's just an incredible resource where you know people can eat. Uh, organic local Victorian foods mostly there's some stuff from further afield um, with or just above wholesale cost there's it's not a, a, a capitalistic business um, so you know can eat really good food um, very affordably um, yeah there's the community forestry work we do here and and run regular workshops and working bees where there's lots of learning opportunities um, yeah, there's probably, Meg's probably, uh, if she was listening in, was probably going, remember this, remember this, this. But there's a number of things across the, uh, the board, but also sideways learning opportunities all the time, looking out for um, friends and young people who need skills. How do we, um, oh, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the, the gatherings that we run, um, so deep listening circles in the forest. So that's more of the sacred work coming together and hearing our stories and sharing our grief. I think that's that's a thing that's often missing in environmental movement is, and I'm not saying environmentalists come to the, uh, these gatherings, it's, it's anybody in the community, a huge range of different people get along. They might come once or they might keep coming every month. But these sorts of monthly rituals of getting together around a fire in the forest on the edge of town and uh, sometimes just having a good old cry. And th these things are medicine. They're all, all of the, you know, the, the, I guess it's a, it's a to look at um, capitalized medicine is uh, very, um, you know, that we pull off the shelf. It's, it's very immediate. It, it can, it's often very effective when we go to a chemist, but really it's the medicine of how we live our lives is what has really come into focus. If we've got good social relations with our neighbors, if we um, have uh, you know, good ecologies around us that we're contributing to, if we're eating well, and all of this can be done on a budget that's well below the poverty line in terms of, in, in terms of our household economy, it's well below the poverty line. That's not to um, cancel out the fact that both Meg and I are, are people of historical privilege and that obviously factors into the fact that uh, that gives us agency. But in, in if, if we have capacity um, uh, to not hand over um, our uh, hard-earned dollar to big, powerful uh, forces, 
um, our souls really reward us for that as well. And that's a part of the medicine um, that we find um, just in living the story that is not 100% uh, giving everything over to, to the 1%. Yeah. I mean, I think it's even quite amazing on Facebook that there are all kinds of uh, routes into this kind of thing. You know, there's Landshare, the Central Victoria site. There's the Castlemaine um, Free Stuff form, Forum. There's lots of different permi sites, permaculture sites, and things on food, different food cultures and food preserving. I mean, our community-oriented and community-run radios, music shows, uh, all of these kind of rich cultural experiences. And um, there's Harcourt Organic Farming Cooperative, which I think is actually a really good, um, good example of transformation um, as much as uh, also um, alternative ways of people cooperating in, um, in production. So they've got fruit gardens and fruit tree nursery. There's the gung-ho growers. There's the cellar farmhouse, creamery, um, going great fruit, which is more into training and all of that kind of thing. Uh, we have so much happening that it's actually, I think, really encouraging in terms of sustainability more generally, but also the potential for degrowth and that people are actually really cutting back and thinking more, well, I only need my basic needs um, met. And um, that ultimately means that one can share with those who haven't got enough. Yeah. I wondered whether Jess had any uh, questions that had come through um, on chat from people who are participating. I've got so many questions of my own. <laughs> so um, I will wait and see if, um, if there are questions from the chat group and um, I would encourage anyone who's listening at the moment to pop those questions in the chat so that we can make the most of having Anitra and Patrick before us. Um, but one thing I did think um, just then when you mentioned that Anitra was that the, um, the relationship that my family has built with our neighbours during COVID times um, has really enriched our lives and hopefully their lives as well. Um, and we have learned a lot from each other about gardening and food sharing and, I don't know, culture swapping. You know, we've been making little gifts for kids and I've been sharing my, my book collection with their children while the library was closed. Lots of that kind of stuff has been happening in communities all over the place, all over the world, I'm sure. Um, but I wondered what you thought about... Um, the impact, I guess, of this crazy year that we've had, 2020 and COVID, um, what kind of impact you think that might have had on the degrowth movement? Um, I can only imagine it's a positive impact, but I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, look, um, I think that there have been like two tendencies and one is actually people suddenly discovering, yes, what it is to be more self-reliant and actually be aware that we are so vulnerable when we have these big global um, food chains and, and all, all the chains of production where we're getting things from uh, China or we're getting them from Europe or there's even just a bit of some kind of device that's coming from there. And if that's blocked, the production can't keep on going. So we even found that, you know, with the protective equipment and that sort of thing, really vital things. People were very worried about toilet paper, you know, like everyone was very nervous and the just-in-time production and those long supply chains were just proof to us how vulnerable they were and how important and how secure and safe and comfortable it feels if we know actually that just down the road there's a dairy where we can get milk each day or whatever. So I think there've been a lot of experiences that people have had um, and perhaps even too just that having to think through, okay, we've got a minimum amount of time and we're only al allowed to do certain um, movements in terms of mobility and whatever, 
what are essential needs? It's been extremely difficult in, in from a degrowth point of view to really get people to focus on onto essential needs. But now everyone's actually been having to do, do it, you know, and they actually see the point of that. On the other hand, because we're still in a kind of capitalist economy, a lot of us have been um, incredibly um, upset and unsettled by the fact that we've got growing debts, mortgages, all of that kind of thing. And so I think there's also a kind of push that will make people just want to rush back to some normality, which is really counterposed to their own experience. Somewhere mm. in between all that, you know, I think some people are going to think more in one direction and more in another direction. But I think it really gives us a, a, that distinction to be able to compare and something that we can actually discuss and is really a good way forward. Yeah. Mm. And it, in many ways, um, the virus has given us such a, an opportunity to see what, um, what our culture is capable of. Um, and you know whether at the big picture part of our culture, the, the dominant uh, players of the culture, um, imposing you know uh, air travel bans and imposing bans on on traveling to work and encouraging people to to stay at home as much as possible. You know, and I think the figure I I read early on in in um, maybe it was in April or somewhere like that that greenhouse gas emissions had fallen by 17%. Now that was imposed by us. So in terms of, you know, but that's catastrophic. And I think what, what degrowth activists are doing is to say to live this step by step, to become much more resilient in the household and community economies is actually a really, has all these positive and health benefits and health, not just to us, but to our environments. It, but it, what you're saying, Jess, about your neighbor's experience, it's like, that just like filled me with joy because that, I'm seeing that everywhere. And while when I turn on ABC news occasionally, <laughs> all I see is just negative story after negative story. And I don't actually watch the news that much. And maybe there are some positive stories coming out, but it, it seems overwhelming that we have to stay in the, the sickness of this terrible evil virus. Whereas actually the virus has, if we see the virus as a, as, as, as an opportunity to learn, to actually glean some wisdom about how we might possibly live differently and how we might start to step by step, household by household, conversation by conversation, action by action, move towards um, ways of life that are convivial, that are socially warming, that um, give people more time to breathe and to think and to relax. Um, and I certainly, you know, from a full-time builder for a, quite a number of years, being stressed out, the more I earned in that time at the height of being a full-time builder, the unhappier I were, was, the more I needed to spend. And that, I, unfortunately, that's the, cult, the main dominant cultural paradigm is a sort of consumption through unhappiness. And when you take back your economic um, realm, power, um, into the household and community economies and share that um, power with others, um, it, the, the need to consume goes so radically downhill because you're, you're meeting so many of your personal needs all the time. Mm. Yeah. So what does your dog eat? That's one significant question. <laughs> yeah, well, so that was one of the questions that has been posted in our chat actually from Jenny and Kay, but I'm sure lots of people are wondering that. What does yeah. your dog eat? Yeah, so <laughs> Zero is a, uh, is a little Jack Russell and he is an awesome uh, rabbiter. So either rabbits that we hunt or snare, uh, roadkill or rabbits that he gets, occasionally butchers bones, but, but his diet is mostly scraps um, from, from the table. So no bought food whatsoever. And he's been to the vet once in his 10 years and that was when he was seven, he got stung by something, maybe a snake. And the vet said, wow, your dog is so healthy. What, what do you feed your dog? And it's like, it's, wow. a, camp, it's a camp dog diet, you know, because our dogs, um, much like us, were, but maybe not as extreme, 
um, with us, but you know, we evolved to um, not have food just constantly on tap. And, yeah. and so Zero, he's sprightly. And in many ways, he's a, he's a real teacher of ours too, in terms of um, how to be in the world. He's got this beautiful um, balance between um, domesticity and feralty or <laughs> domesticity and wildness. And it's like, well, that's exactly what we're trying to cultivate because that's the hardiness. He will, he'll love to sleep on the couch on a rainy day like today, but he'll also be out there in the forest just like, you know, Vim hoffing it um, on a, any other day. So. <laughs> That's fantastic. And can I say that Zero is the best name for a dog and especially the best name for a dog of a degrowth practitioner. That's awesome. <laughs> um, okay, I've got to get through a couple of other questions here. Bernadette has asked... Um, how can you see degrowth working or starting in communities where there isn't a lot of existing networks or organisations with people of a like mind, i.e. how do you start from scratch? That's a big question. <laughs> Anitra, do you want to start off? Um, yeah, well, I think that a lot of people who get attracted to degrowth do start with themselves. You know, so it's a simple living concept and, and with their households. And it's really great because um, immediately you're using your mind more than you normally do and you and you come up with all these kind of crazy things. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, like if I reuse an envelope, but I've, then I've got to use sticky tape and I've got to this, that and the other, what's the balance between what I'm really wasting and what I'm using? And it really throws you in the deep end. So actually not having those connections can be sort of quite good. But then the next thing is, is that you do talk around and you do start noticing that there are kinds of ways that certain people work that is more collaborative, even if it's kind of in a growth economy. There, there's always within the kind of mainstream economy that we've got, there have been people who've always really cared about, their, about how they do things um, or about their staff and that kind of thing. So you start to actually recognise the quality, quality of things around you as well. So I think it is an approach that, that sort of is mental, but then it becomes practical and it becomes reflective again. And, yeah. and just to build on that a little bit too is um, to start with oneself is I think is the best place to start get our own thoughts and creative practices into place um, and and start modeling things as well because it, rather than just sort of like a lot of politics is just putting stuff onto other people which are not even tested so to to, to do it quietly in your own homes first and and hopefully have a partner or kids on board and you know it, it becomes fun and creative and then as, as a community elder of ours in, in this um, ne neck of the woods, Sue Dennett um, always says, three households is the new normal. You can establish a new normal with just three households. So um, look out for, um, you know, maybe start something to find those households uh, where you share common values around, I guess, for want of a better term, or, you know, the best term is, is that frugal abundance, values around frugal abundance. To find those in your neighbourhood, in your street, in your community, um, which you don't quite know where they might be hiding or, you know, hanging out, they'll be there. You know, there's most most people kind of get very excited by this stuff, regardless of where we come from. Um, and uh, yeah, so, uh, but if you you know, once once that household, once those household uh, you, you've got enough confidence in what you're doing. You, there might be some gift that comes out of that exploration and you say, right, I'm really into, say, you know, Meg, for example, fermenting. Um, mm. I don't really know anything about it, but my Polish grandmother was a great pickler and maybe I should, you know, reach, uh, ask her a few questions. And, and then, um, and then you know, the ne Meg, what, what Meg did was then go up and, and just basically say, I'm going to do a sauerkraut. Um, workshop at the local neighborhood center and then found all these people that were interested and then out of that slowly it grew into this great big thing this amazing network of fermenters who are you know it's much more than about fermenting it's it's mm. about social 
cohesion and love and bartering. And there's always this exchange of gifts um, when those things are happening. So yeah, start small, um, start from where your gift is and, um, and then, yeah, go outside. I mean, even lots of people, um, I think, start these things by putting little, um, uh, like little stalls outside uh, their house, like mm. a, you know, a free food store or an exchange store. Exactly. Yeah. That really gets the conversations going. I think yeah. um, for us, what we do is when a new neighbor comes in, it's like immediately over there with a whole lot of eggs and, and pickles and stuff like that and say, g'day. We're not, we don't, we, you know, we're not going to be in your face, but, you know, here we are, this is who we are and, and welcome to, to the neighborhood. So with new neighbors establishing, because sometimes when we've been living next side by side with people for a long time, and it's just been that sort of, sort of <laughs> high bias sort of thing, it's yeah. actually hard to start it. So it's really good to sort of go, right, new neighbor. All right, let's go in with the love. <laughs> yeah. I wish you were my neighbor with eggs and pickles. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, that, that, there was an extension of that question as well given by Claire um, and I think you've kind of answered it in your um, in what you've just said anyway but she kind of said um, how do you suggest moving towards this shift without um, while well, you're still living in an urban environment so you don't have necessarily the opportunity to land and um, big gardens but I think you've kind of talked um, a bit about how it starts with yourself and it starts with a connection and a, a small connection and it's not necessarily um, hinging on having access to an orchard or a forest or a garden environment. Would you, do you have anything more to add to that? Well, I mean, there's, we're short on time and I've spoken a lot, but I will just quickly do a plug for David Holmgren's book, Retro Suburbia. It, yeah. it is a manifesto for that question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, get it, go to your local library. Um, there's a Retro Suburbia community page. Um, but yeah, it is, most of us live in urban areas and, um, or suburban areas. And mm -hmm. so that's a really great place to start. Yeah. And I yeah. think just linking in with that is that question around um, questioning property. You know, from my point of view, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't like property. I mean, we can just have commons. We can just um, be here as stewards of the earth and sharing and caring for everyone. Property doesn't kind of exist and doesn't have to exist. Um, and in fact, if we look at that in our urban areas, you know, there are more areas where people, there are all these nature strips that people can be using and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, we can yeah. be quite creative. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. You just said that, Anitra, because one of the other questions that we've got here in our chat from Richard um, was around exactly that. So he posed the question, um, do you think the degrowth movement does require or would be positively impacted by a change to the concept of property or yeah. perhaps the institution of property itself? Yeah, yeah that's right. But I think that we need to be just looking at all natural and social cultural resources as commons. They're things yeah. that we ought to be sharing. We just yeah. shouldn't be thinking, we shouldn't be fragmenting them off and owning them and that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Um, I've got one more question if you guys have got time. I know we started a tiny bit late, so I'm hoping I can squeeze this one in. Um, Michael has asked um, if there's any observations on the behavior change component of cooperative living over to you Anita. Uh, yes well um question to end on i realize <laughs> yeah yeah that's right um okay so i do think that actually living with people and working cooperatively is quite different from the ways that we've been brought up you know that we have our own bedroom and that we do this and that we do that and actually living cooperatively most people do have their own bedroom but um sharing things does require people to learn skills and it's not an easy thing sometimes to do to begin with and so that kind of aspect of behavior change as it were i think some some skills can be um 
can be learnt in workshops and that kind of thing. But again, a lot of it, it has just got to do with reflection and thinking about, oh, why do I feel uncomfortable when this happens or that happens and, uh, and those sorts of things. But one probably key thing, which is quite a difference I find between mainstream society and um, a lot of um, movements that are looking for transformation towards greater equality and environmental sustainability. And that is, is, is that we, we teach and we learn not to be scared of conflicts and to actually see conflicts as something that you actually dwell on and that you unpack and that you look at as a challenge in a very constructive and positive way rather than just kind of like be in denial, avoiding, talking behind people's backs and that kind of thing. Mm. So again, there's a kind of like an openness and a transparency. And I think that's part of what a lot of the behaviour change that I've sort of experienced has been about. Yeah. Meg, Meg and I, a few years back, set up Landshare Central Victoria to, to match uh, people without land to, uh, who, who, need, who need land, who want access to land with uh, people who have land but have too much land to manage. Um, and there's been all sorts of really interesting relationships build. And I think this is a, just a transitional moment of learning to share land. Um, but I think just to pick up on what Anitra is saying is that the, it's a longer term project. It's a political project that it involves indigenous sovereignty but it's a longer term project to deprivatize land or to at least get the housing market or the, or the um, into, base, uh, into a basic needs, a decapitalized um, basic needs like bread. Um, you know, the, there's so many of those things. Um, but what, I guess just to go back and say, um, well, uh, uh, regardless of where we're living, there are things we can do to uh, decouple ourselves from um, capital, capital and industrial systems of food, energy, and medicine. They're the, they're the, and it's not to say we're not going to fall back on these things. It's just to reduce our reliance on these things step by step, maybe 1% the first year, maybe 5% the second year, just not to demoralize ourselves by going too fast, to put these slow step-by-step things in what what can i get what a what a dandelion dandelions grow all around me so urban foraging is is a big thing in in melbourne I, many of my friends are in, working in that space um there's many ways what was that dumpster diving dumpster diving of course mm. is another one is is it's not um it's either using waste or or learning knowledges that uh, enable us to slowly move um away from uh industrial forms of um, medicine, food, and energy. Yeah, and and I, I've got in my sights, um, you know, the much longer pr project of deprivatizing property, and um, it's a long story. It goes back to our indigenous peasants in in Europe, um, kick, uh, kicked off the commons, our ancestors. Um, you know, primitive accumulation. It's a deep history which is then intersected by the 15, 1600s into uh, indigenous societies around the world and all that trauma and all that suffering we're still paying for. So if people really, yeah, there's some really great books like The Invention of Capitalism by Michael Perelman that really unpacks that, um, you know, that the, the enclosures, the clearances that happened that then, you know, to, to uh, uh, Europeans and then then generationally later, or several generations later, we're doing the same thing to indigenous people um, in, in the Americas and in, in Australia and New Zealand and many other places. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I, you know, there's lots of work to be done and lot, most of it is fun. Some of it's hard work and good, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I feel like we could probably talk for another hour, but I am conscious that, um, you know, that we have been talking for an hour and um, that's probably enough food for thought for now. But I want to thank you both. You have really given us a lot of food for thought um, and a lot of um, 
uh, a lot of phrases that are, are new to me, like decoupling. I love that word. That's my new my new catchphrase. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I would like to say um, this was a Goldfields Library event, so please check out the the Goldfields Library's website. We have um, <laughs> thank you. We have really shifted um, all of our programming online, and there's some fantastic things going on. So. I would encourage everyone to check out what's coming up next. Um, if you would like to buy Anitra's book, I would also encourage you to do that. The best way to do it at the moment um, is through Pluto Books. Uh, you can see that, you'll be able to see that on the screen um, shortly. You can buy it online. It's, you can also contact our local bookseller, Stoneman's Book Room, and they will be able to um, source it for you. And of course, it's available at the library. Um, we, I have one copy here. We have a number of other copies and I know that there'll be lots of reservations waiting for me when I get into work tomorrow, I'm sure. I'd also just like to give a little plug to the Castlemaine Seed Library because um, it's awesome and they do such a fantastic job that it's totally run by volunteers and we at the library really take the credit <laughs> where it's not deserved. But even though the library's closed, at the moment you can access the seed library we felt it was so important especially at this time of year to give people access to seeds to grow their own food so if you are listening and you're local to Castlemaine um, please pop in and borrow some seeds grow some food um, that's all from me thank you very much Patrick thank you very much Anitra for joining us tonight Thanks, Anitra. and we thank Stuart and Stuart, yes. Of course. Thank you, Stuart, for getting us over the technology. We would never got here. <laughs> he suddenly got us on his wings and winged in. Yes, he's amazing. All, all thanks to Stuart. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone.